Good morning, everybody. It is good to have you in the house of the Lord. Uh, I want to start off with a couple of announcements. Uh, on Tuesday, we're going to have Shrove Pancake Supper uh, from 5 to 7, and then you can go to your meeting if you're a part of the finance committee. You can come do that. You can get fat and happy and then enjoy the finances. <laughs> um, Oh, okay, come for the pancakes, not the sausage. I, I don't know what that is. That sounds like pork bellies to me. But anyway, <laughs> all right. And then on Wednesday, we have Ash Wednesday service, and that's at Tabernacle uh, on the 22nd at 7 p.m., and I'm preaching, so I'd, I'd thank you for your support. I'd love for you guys to come on out and be a part of that. That Wednesday, we will have no men's or women's or Zoom Bible studies, and there will be no wonderful Wednesdays that day, just so that you know that that's happening. And we also are doing our mission for the month. Our mission for the month has to do with CareNet, and I'm going to ask for uh, Lee to give us a, a video about this so that you understand a little bit about what we're doing. Anybody remember this from last year? Okay, well, we're doing it again and we're trying to beat our goal what we did last year. Take a look. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. We invite you to pick up a bottle today and fill it. Fill it with coins or things that don't make noise. In other words, dollars. Denise, would you come on up, please? Denise is going to share a brief uh, message about the council meeting coming up. Morning. Uh, thanks to all that came out for our presentation a few weeks ago and for the meeting with the district superintendent two weeks ago. Um, we will be at our next council meeting kind of looking at some of the things we've learned and uh, some of the 
what we might want to do with our next steps. And I just wanted to let everybody know that every council meeting is open to the entire congregation. So if you have thoughts, uh, questions, concerns that you would like to share, please come to that meeting. It's gonna be on February 28th, Tuesday night, seven o'clock right here. If you have any questions um, before then, you can speak to me, uh, Carol Bookwalter, Vernon Kruger, Dave Creasy, go back there, Pastor Tricia. Um, and we just need, you know, we need to know how the congregation is thinking and, and you know, the direction you feel like we should go because we will be considering that at that meeting on the 28th. Thank and you. And we should go forward or put a pause on it. Absolutely. Okay. I think that's it, right? Let's center ourselves and focus on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith.
And that's why I don't ring bells. <laughs> that was a very hard piece. Thank you guys so much. Would you please stand for our call to worship? To those who are hungry, Jesus says, Come and eat. More than is more than enough for all. To those who are thirsty, Jesus says, Come and drink. It's free for the taking. Stop wasting your money on food that does not satisfy. Come to me and you will find everything you need. Today we come to Jesus, knowing he is our provision and will fulfill our every need. Our opening hymn of praise is, Come ye sinners, poor and needy. Let us pray. Oh God, as we come today, we come as those who need your presence. We come as those who need your truth. We come as those who are hungry and thirsty and need to be filled. Father, I ask for your presence among us today, that you would pour out your Holy Spirit, that as we are enlivened, as we are blessed, that we might know the fullness of you. It is in Jesus' holy name we pray, and all of the people say, Amen. Amen. Please remain standing as we affirm our faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the re forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You know, about this time in the service, I get a little hungry, so I brought some snacks. But my mama taught me something. I don't like it, but she taught it to me. She said, unless I have enough for everybody, I can't eat in front of them. So I guess I got to wait, huh? Yeah. Looks real good, though, doesn't it? Fruit snacks, crackers, I don't know. This reminds me of a story, a story we're going to be talking about of Jesus. Jesus and his disciples were working through the day, and late afternoon it started getting so that they were tired. Yep, you can go on and yawn. <sighs> and they were hungry. What happens to you when you're hungry? Does your stomach growl? Yep. And so Jesus realized that they had been working hard, so he said, get in the boat, and let's just go on up the shore a bit and get us some food. So he thought maybe they'd get a chance to rest, and then they'd get some food up there. So they got in the boat, and they went on up the shore, and you know what happened? All those people that were on the shore that they left were still there. So they didn't get to eat, and they were hungry, and they were tired. And those disciples started getting grumpy. But not Jesus. When he saw all those people... He started ministering to him. He started preaching the word to him. He gave a four-hour sermon. <laughs> and by that time, the disciples were really grumpy. And they said, will you please get rid of them people? Because I want to eat, and I'm tired. And Jesus said, no, you feed them. So I don't know about you, but when you're tired and you're grumpy... You don't want to do something that mom and dad say for you to do, right? You don't feel like it. And I don't get real happy with, with Bubba when he invites people over at the, the, to have lunch with us after I've been preaching. Because I'm tired and I'm hungry. I don't want to be messed with. So, that's kind of how they felt. So they said, get rid of them. And Jesus said, no, you feed them. He said, but we don't have any food. We don't have any money. We can't go to the restaurant because it was real far away. And he said, well, what do you got? He said, well, I got a few crackers and some fruit snacks and an apple. No, that's not what they had. He had a couple of loaves of bread and two fish. But there were 5,000 plus people there. There were children with the, with the, with the dads. There were the men, the 5,000. And there was other, these people called women, them wives, they should have been cooking the dinner, right? <laughs> so he says, bring me what you got. And so they brought him the five loaves and the two fish. And he took it, Jesus took it in his hands. 
and he lifted it up and he blessed it. And then he started giving it to the disciples. He said, line them people up. Put them sheep in the right pews. Get them all in order. And then go give them the food. And you know what? There was enough food for over 15,000 people. Five loaves of bread and two fish. How did Jesus do that? How did he do that? Got any idea? What kind of hocus pocus alamogokus he did? Got any idea? Well, uh, it's kind of hard to figure out, isn't it? The, well, you know, that's because they lift, he lifted it up to God the Father. And when he prayed to God the Father, he asked God the Father to provide. And God the Father provided everything that was needed. Jesus knew that if he had God, and if it was in his hands, that God would do a great thing. Now, I want to take a segue to sometimes you feel like you don't have enough. Maybe you're doing sports or you're doing something and you don't quite feel like you're good enough or you don't quite feel like what you have to offer is that much, right? And, and so you kind of hesitate as to whether to give it or not. Well, that's kind of what the disciples were doing. But when they put what they had, who they were, in Jesus' hands, the miracle happened. And so that's something we got to remember, even though we don't think we're much or we don't think we have much to give. When we give our little bit, God can make it a miracle much. Isn't that cool? So it's really important that we, even though we don't think we're good enough, for us to give and to allow God to multiply it for his glory. So you want to pray with me about that? You want to pray with me about that? Let's go to Jesus. Dear God, we thank you so much that we really are a nobody. And what we have isn't much. And we also thank you that this nobody can become somebody because of Jesus. We place ourselves in your hands today and ask you to work through us that you might be glorified and people might see the miracle of Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you, gentlemen and ladies.
We have been journeying through the gospel of Mark. Good. And we're looking at Mark's Messiah, and we're asking three questions. What's the first one? Who am I that the Lord of all the earth? Who is Jesus? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Say it louder. What difference does it make? Yeah. Yeah, those are important questions. Now, we don't think they're important, but they really are because they basically will control or direct who we are, whose we are, and how we live our lives. And so we're going to be looking at a miracle today, the miracle of Jesus turning bread, five barley loaves and two fish. Say five barley loaves and two fish. Five barley loaves and two fish into a, enough food to feed 15,000. So it is in that that we're going to ask these questions when I read the text. Who are you? Who is Jesus? Do you believe this story about Jesus and what we're going to hear? Is, do you believe it's true? Or is it just some sort of myth that's in this book? This book is the what? B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's a book for me. The Bible. If you believe it, what difference does it make in your life? What difference does the word of God make in your life? And if it is truth, is he your, who are you, is he your miracle worker, the one who will provide all things for you in this life, and in eternity. Good question, right? So we're going to do that. We're going to read the text. I'm going to pray. And then you're going to get some food. The apostles, otherwise known as the disciples, gathered around Jesus and reported to him all they had done and taught. Then, because so many people, oy they were coming and going. They did not even get a chance to eat. They didn't have their apple, and they were getting grumpy, and Jesus said to them, come with me by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place, but many who saw them Ran along the shoreline, they didn't say that, but many who saw them leaving recognized them and they ran on foot all from the town and they got there ahead of him. When Jesus landed and saw the large crowd, he had compassion on them. That word compassion means a breaking of his heart because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he began to teach them, feed them, many things. By this time, it was late in the day, and his disciples are saying, Oy vey! (laughs) Send them away, because this is a remote place. It's already late. Send them so that they can go over down to Pocosin Diner, no, down to surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But Jesus answered them, No, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, that would take more than half a year's wages. Are we to go and spend that much on bread and give it to them to eat? How many loaves do you have? Now the loaves would probably be about this big. And he says, as they went and found out, five loaves and two fish. And then Jesus directed them to have all the people sit down on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties, taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up in heaven, Jesus gave thanks to God and then he gave it to his disciples to distribute to the people. He also divided the two fish among them and they all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up, read this with me, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. The number of men who had eaten was 5,000. 
five barley loaves and two fish. Wow. Let's pray. God, we just thank you for your abundance. We thank you for the way you show off in the scriptures. We thank you for the way you are a miracle maker. We thank you for the way that you are God, Jehovah. You are Jesus, our Savior. You are the Holy Spirit. You infill us. You allow us to know the fullness of your presence. Come and be with us today as we look at this text. That we might truly come and discern who we are. What we believe about you. And come to a realization of what that means in our lives. Is this word true? Is the word of God true? Is the bread of life true? Show us God. Show off God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, you need to know the context so you can understand how everything's unflowing. Uh, what, what's beginning to happen is the disciples about... So many verses before this are sent out on their first missionary journey. They're sent out to heal. They're sent out to feed. They're sent out to cast out demons. They're sent to bring an understanding of who Jesus is in the midst of this area. And when they come back, they're excited. Woo! Man, they're having a revival at Asbury. Isn't that cool? Yeah? Man, I saw somebody get healed. I saw somebody who was blind could see. Right now we're watching Jackie be healed in ICU. That's a miracle. So as God was moving, they were excited. And as they come back to Jesus, they're not only excited, they're exhausted. Because it's been day and night and night and day and day and night and night and day. And the people are still following them around. And they're still asking for the ministry of the disciples. And just as they were following Jesus, they're following the disciples. And Jesus realizes something that he forgot to teach them. He thought he had taught them. Maybe they just didn't get it. Most probably that. And that was that they needed a place of rest. You know, we often run our lives to the very end, packing our schedules to beyond. And Jesus said, no, get in the boat with me, and let's go take uh, uh, some rest. Let's go take a rest. Let's go take some time where you can be restored. Because that is the rhythm of ministry, you know. That's why we have Sabbath. That's why we come on Sunday. It's not so we have one more thing on our list. It's so we can sit and be filled by the presence of God. And it's in that place that he comes and he teaches them what it means to be alone with Jesus. And as they sought that rest for themselves, they get in the boat. And as they're going up the shoreline, all the people back there say, I know where they're going. And they run as fast as they can. And before they can even get there, they're crying out to Jesus. By this time, the disciples are tired. They got a little bit of grump osis on them, you know. They're thinking, dang, I thought we were going to get to eat. And Jesus, instead of saying, let's get back in the boat, let's go somewhere else, begins to see the people. And when he sees the people, it says that he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. What he sees is, is sheep who need God's word. What he sees is sheep who need to be fed by the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so... Instead of sending them away, once again, Jesus begins to teach the word. Four hour sermon or more until it gets dark. And when it gets dark, something's going to happen. Now, before I go there, I want to ask what your understanding is of sheep. I just want to be a sheep. Bye, 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 bye. 
Who's a sheep? They're not very smart. In the scripture, who does Jesus say are the sheep? Go ba ba ba. There's some issues there with sheep. You know, they go to the water and they drink, but then they fall over and they can't get up. I've fallen and I can't get up. And they'll drown in the water. Mm. There's also an issue with sheep is they can't find food. There's also an issue with sheep is they're very vulnerable. They don't have any plate, anything they can do to kick or fight or anything like that. They're just dumb sheep. And so when Jesus sees them, he realizes their predicament. They don't have anybody to lead them by still waters, lead them to the green pastures so that they might, the Lord is my shepherd, I will not be in want. And they were wanting really bad. And so they come to this place and, 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 and Jesus is ministering and he keeps ministering and he, because your needs are great, right? Your needs are great, right? And when somebody calls the pastor at 11 o'clock at night and they need to talk, your needs are great. And so we just keep pouring that out. And there's Jesus just pouring it out. And, and, and this is when the disciples get a little ticked off. They get ticked off because, you see, they saw this as work. That's why you don't want a pastor that sees this as a job. You want a pastor who sees this as a calling. And so they saw it as work, and they're saying, look, you've been preaching four hours, Jesus. It's time to go down to Wendy's. <laughs> Send them on back. Get rid of them, Jesus. And what does Jesus say? No, Tricia, make lunch for everybody. Jane, we're coming to your house today. She's ready. Only if you're having pound cake. <laughs> you get it? And so tired and weary and grumpy, Jesus tells them that they need to be the ones that feed the sheep. Now, all of a sudden, this starts attacking their pocketbook. You know, we'll give anything to Jesus, but not money, man. <laughs> And they get a little bit upset. They say, well, that would cost us a year's wages just to go feed all these people. I found out it's going to cost almost $2,000 for the rehearsal dinner for Robbie's wedding. Lord, in your mercy, we're only having 70 people. Come on now. Clearly, they realize, or do they, who's in charge? Jesus asked them, what do you got? Well, we got five loaves of bread, and we got, and we got, and that's pretty pathetic. I don't know about you, but I want to be first in that potluck line because I want a little bite of that fish. I ain't going to be there at the end of 15,000 people. Depends on what fish it is. It would have been salt fish, only about that big. And I don't like sardines, so I guess y'all can go first. <laughs> anyway, so there they are, and here's Jesus, and they're thinking that they got to do something. Isn't that how we are often? We think we got to do something. I mean, they've already given Jesus the suggestion of how to solve the problem. You can tell those disciples were men. DoorDash. Ain't no DoorDash. So they're in this place, but what they don't realize is that Jesus is about to show them something, not only about who are they, but who he is and what a difference that makes in their life. Once they bring these Five barley loaves and 
from their traveling baskets. And they give it to Jesus, this little bit. He begins to tell them. Now realize this is before the miracle. Go line them up. The scripture actually says in vegetable rows. <laughs> I thought that was cute. In vegetable rows. Line them up. Put 50 here and 50 there. And, you know, like we do the chairs out there in the potluck. And you, you know what I'm talking about. Line them up. Get them all in order. Because Jesus was about to do a miracle. And then he takes the bread and he says these words. And listen to these words really close. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, the one who brings forth bread on the earth. Blessed are you, O oh God. You see, Jesus knew that it was not the disciples. It was not what we had, but what God had. And the blessing that he would bring, that would bring the miracle. And we miss that so often, don't we? We think we got to solve the problem. We think we're the solution. It is God that is the solution. And when we put what we have in God's hand, all of a sudden things start shifting in the right direction. All of a sudden we begin to see what God can do in and through us. And more than that, it's not about us at all. Because we could do nothing with That's just absurd to think we could in the first place. So God's miraculously multiplied these loaves and these fish, and over 15,000 people were fed. 5,000 were the men. I'm sure there's at least 5,000 children, and I know there was at least 5,000 women, and they did not cook anything that day. Glory! God did it! <laughs> But can it really be true? Can it really be true? Did Jonah really live in the belly of a whale for three days? Did Jesus really walk on water? Mm. I hear a few back here saying yes. But what about you? What do you believe? In my mind, he did it. In my mind, he performed this miracle. In my mind, he fed, and not only did he feed them, their hunger was satisfied, and there was baskets of leftovers. I love leftovers. There were 12 baskets of leftovers because there were 12 disciples, and it came out of... Do you believe this story? Are you sure? Or is it some myth in some mythical book? I mean, maybe you believe this one. But maybe you don't believe in tithing 10%. Maybe you believe this one. But maybe you don't believe in speaking in tongues. Maybe you believe this one, but on some days you don't let Jesus be your shepherd. So what do we believe? The feeding of the 5,000, as well as many of the supernatural scriptures, things that we would call a little charismatic things that we can't logically in our mind work out, cannot be scientifically pro proven or are irrational, have fallen into a form as we know as biblical criticism. It comes in and actually began in the Enlightenment age when they embraced a philosophy called naturalism. The ism is they say that if it's not in nature, it's not around you, then it's not truth. 
only what you can see with your eyes, hear with your ears, and proven science makes it true. We can't have any supa, supra, super naturalism things. And that began back in the 19th century. It began with a thing which we know as biblical criticism and is known as the 19th century liberalism of the day. Are we feeling the effects today? Absolutely. That understanding of systematic theology where the Bible, there were things that were right and things were not right, began to multiply... And then it became pervasive in the influence in mainline churches in the United States in the late 19th century. There were places in the scripture you could believe. I don't like that one about sin. I don't like that one about tithing. And there were things in the scripture that you couldn't believe. Now, I'm going there today because the irony is that the people who were what we call the liberal progressives didn't want to lose the church. They didn't want to lose and reject what was. They just want to reject supernaturalism and the errancy of the Bible. Inerrancy. If you catch my drift. They wanted things to stay the same. They wanted the building. They wanted the people. They wanted a viable place for religion and ethics. And they claimed that Jesus was a very ethical, moral teacher. Kind of sounds like Jehovah's Witnesses. Hmm. And they said that there is still room for religion as long as we're allowed to get in touch with our inner spiritual self and our feelings. And this is where the transition went. They threw out the salvific Christological image of Jesus and they placed in its place, love your brother as yourself. They disconnected what was important in the scripture from what made them feel good. Think about that. Now, I'm saying that to you now because the theory ended up being an understanding that focused not on God, but on what we could do. So they purported different myths about the things that happened in the Bible. They began to critique it with what we call biblical criticism, uh, the historical Jesus method. Anybody know about that? The seminars, the what did Jesus say, the Jesus seminars, let's throw so many rocks and see if this really was something Jesus said. There was a whole lot of stuff going on in that day. So the theories were this. There was three main theories. One was this was just a fraudulent myth. Jesus was a good guy. He's somebody we should follow, his behavior, but we shouldn't take his history too seriously because it wasn't real. That was one theory. Another theory was, I think, even abusive of Jesus, that Jesus knew that they were going to go up the shore. He got the disciples to run, and there was a cave there, and he got them to hide all this food in the cave. And when he preached, he began to do the hocus pocus, alamogocus, poof. And when he prayed, he got the disciples, and everybody's eyes were closed, <laughs> to go get the bread and feed everybody. That to me is abusive. That's just a downright lie. (laughs) And the third one was the one I heard in high school. I don't know if you heard this. But what it was, was Jesus did not perform the miracle of multiplying loaves and fish. What happened was there was one little boy, if you read John, 
or if you read the other Gospels, the disciples had a little basket and in it were And when they realized what they had, it wasn't enough. And there were some people who had brought something to the potluck and other people who had not. So those who had shared with those who did not. And therefore, everybody ate. So I want you to think about that a minute. Where does that place the movement of God? Is that in God? It's in people. See the divide? God is our Savior, our provider, the one who gives us. He's our all in all. We can do that ourselves. So it was that divide that began to remove Jesus from the scriptures. It was that textual criticism that brought him into a place that depleted the narrative and said, that was not a miracle. What was the miracle is that we did something. Took the focus off of God and God's word and its inerrancy and focused it on ethical beliefs. And any time we take the word and don't believe what it says, it transforms his word into our ethical beliefs and wants and changes the text into what we want to make it to suit our own purpose. Wow. And we thought this was just a little myth. Huh. If we don't realize how serious this is, just one little step to the left, or one little step to the right and not keeping in the center, not upholding the integrity of the scriptures, we begin to be on that sliding slope. I think we're already there. There is no biblical literacy in our world today. I remember in seminary, Dr. Hal Racinos. How Racinos never really preached from the scriptures. He was always talking about social justice. We need to get out and feed the hungry. We need to get out and clothe the naked. We need to do all these things. And I said, well, how? that's great. But shouldn't we be feeding them the bread of life? And he kind of scoffed at me. Well, they're not going to want Jesus if you don't feed them. I said, yeah, but if they don't have Jesus, they're going to be hungry tomorrow. If they don't have Jesus, they're not going to know how to go fishing. They're not going to know what it means to be filled. Aren't we supposed to give them Jesus too? I remember every time I would confront him, I wondered, does he really know Jesus? Does he really know the word of God? Is he even saved? I was doing some research, and R.C. Sproul shares a similar time when he was in seminary. And one of his professors were teaching that the Bible is not the inerrant word of God. And he went to the professor, and he says, I know you believe this isn't the word of God, but I've got a question for you. And this is the question. If this is not the real truth, then Jesus isn't the real Savior. And without Christ, we're all going to... Anybody know that word? Yeah. Paul says it this way. If the word of God is not the word of God and Jesus is not Jesus, then we're the most to be pitied. And I'll be honest with you, we're wasting our time. Thank you very much for coming out and seeing me. Thank you very much for sitting in the pew Sunday after Sunday. Thank you very much because it strokes my ego. Not. You know, everybody else is, it's a good day out there. We should be on a boat. We should be on the beach. We should be up at the diner eating. 
I have no interest in adoring, worshiping, praising, working for a myth, or even a partial truth. I've given my life to the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if the liberal understanding is right, I have wasted my life. But they're not right. Not only are they not right, they're desperately wrong. They're fatally wrong. They're eternally wrong. This word of God makes all the difference in the world in our lives. Jesus was the bread of life, is the bread of life. He will feed you if you are hungry. He is the one who will feed you each and every day with the word of God. So I'm going to ask you those questions again. I want you to hear these questions. Who are you? Who are you? Are you a believer? Are you a Bible believer? Who is Jesus? Is this a myth or is this truth? Did he really walk on water? Did he really make the blind to see? Did he really heal people? What difference does that make in our lives? Is he the miracle maker? The one who can provide all things for you here and in eternity? If he is, say hallelujah. hallelujah. Because that's where I'm going to be. I'm a believer. Born again with the Holy Spirit, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. Who are you? Who is Jesus? And what difference does that make in your life? Let us pray. Oh God, we come today and there may be some of us who are kind of on the edge. We're not so sure we can trust everything in that word. Or we can even trust the word made flesh. That guy named Jesus, is he real? <laughs> but God, I know who you are. And I pray that you would reveal yourself to those who have gathered here today. Father, I come in the name of Jesus. And I pray for Jackie. I pray that the blood would dissipate in her brain, that her mouth would be able to speak, Epratha, in the name of Jesus, Epratha, in the name of Jesus, that she may be able to speak with diction, that her mind and her brain will connect with her tongue, Epratha. I pray, God, in the name of Jesus, that you would be with Savannah Francis on Tuesday. I pray even now as that doctor prepares that you would allow his hands to be strengthened for the power and presence of the Holy Spirit as he works that miracle in her body. <laughs> Father, I pray for Mary Ellen today. I ask, Lord, that as she struggles with this voice, as she struggles with her throat, as she struggles with all the things that physical ailments bring, Lord, that you would give her hope eternal, that you would fill her spirit with your spirit, and that she would have the joy of the Lord. I pray, Father, for Laurie today. I ask, Lord, that you would continue to work with her doctors as they work on those kidneys. Bring them to full health, Lord. Bring them to full health. Father, we pray for those who are not saved today. We pray that your power and presence would wash over them and they would say, yes, Jesus. Open their eyes that they might see and their hearts that they might receive. And Father, continue to guide us. I want to take some time now for you to lift up and cry out in the name of Jesus for those who who need healing. Father, I pray for the United Methodist Church 
and the challenges that we're facing today. Give us your grace. Give us your mercy. Lead us, because we are dumb sheep. (laughs) Father, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our closing song today is not what you see on the screen. It's number 171. You probably know it. We're going to sing it at least two times. I'm going to invite you to stand as you are able that we might share this song. The name of Jesus. <laughs> we come and we bow before you, Lord. We thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you that you come into our lives, that you shake us up. Shake us up and call us to be faithful. Help us to know who we are in you. Help us to know who you are in us. And help us to know what a difference you can make in us and in our world. It is in Jesus' name we go forth. And all the people say, Amen.